thank you thank you dr anshuman ji thank you for those wonderful remarks and uh, a very studied intervention uh, as uh, from your side so i will be very happy now to introduce our panel and other guests with you uh, to discuss about this particular issue so we have professor kashinath pandita uh, who will talk about it from a human rights perspective professor pandita uh, is a academician a well known name in the academic circles he was uh, born in uh, jammu kashmir and who is president of asia eurasia human rights forum uh, uh, he was awarded a ugc emeritus fellowship for central asian studies in 78 to 88 and uh, president and vice president of india in 1985 and 87 for his academic attainments has awarded him that fellowship also he has received uh, the highest civilian award of indian government uh, which is padma shri and uh, he is uh, our uh, president of uh, this particular organization we have dr um, uh, we have alok bansal uh, who is executive director of south asian institute of strategic affairs Uh, and also director of india foundation he has authored several books so he'll be talking about this issue from a uh, security perspective and in order to we, we also felt that media is a crucial element of uh, in covering all these issues so we are very pleased to also have mr praful ketka who is a uh, editor of organizer uh, which is uh, bharat prakashan delhi limited Uh, uh which is bharat prakash and delhi limited organization and uh, so we will be basically covering it from academic perspective from human right perspective from security perspective and from media perspective so what i'll do now is i'll request uh, all the panelists starting from professor pandita followed by mr praful ketka and then uh, mr alok bansal to give their brief intervention for 2 minutes and then we will move towards question and answers and i will uh, ask certain questions to the panel so that we flesh out some of these issues so starting with you professor pandita please your your couple of minutes of intervention on all these issue uh, i i must congratulate you for organizing this wonderful webinar and beginning with a very learned presentation by our panelists uh, which has been touching almost uh, almost all important aspects of the issue uh, i think that the issue is so big that one cannot do justice in, to it in one go but still it is enlightening to know some of the major aspects that have been thrown up uh the the the, the fundamental question is uh the composition of the uh segment of population in our country uh, which has been forced to take up arms and uh, launch an armed confrontation with the government under the name of uh, in whatever name nationalism nationalism or uh, maoism or whatever uh, perhaps somewhere uh, we our socio economic structuring of the country uh, needs to be uh, uh, brought under drastic reform so that the disparity bit of disparity in income disparity in classes is reduced to the lowest level that perhaps is one of the reasons why uh, we have this commotion of uh, nationalism and maoism in our country the second point which i would like to make is that uh, as we know uh, Maoism comprises essentially comprises three elements. It wants to capture the base. The fundamental aim is to capture state power. 
for introducing the democracy of its own type. For capturing state power, there are three instruments which they are following. One is armed insurgency. So they legitimize armed insurgency against the state. And the second is mass mobilization. To mobilize the masses through indoctrination, through brainwashing, through creation of uh, fear, suspicion, whatever, so that their movement is strengthened by numerically, strengthened by the people. And third is strategic alliance, to develop strategic alliances. Developing strategic alliances is what we may very easily say that even in our parliament, we have the sympathizers. The MPs are the sympathizers. In states, MLAs are sympathizers. The ministers are some of the ministers are sympathizers. So a whole group of sympathizers has been created who plead their cause. Uh, my predecessor has touched upon the human rights aspect, which is very important from my point of view. Now, human rights is something which is universal according to the Charter of the United Nations Human Rights, 1948. And it states that even a criminal has the human rights. His human rights have to be valid. In 2018, Maharashtra police arrested five people on the charges that they were supporting Maoism. The court set them free and said that dissent How is the government going to tackle this issue? Because we have the democratic government. And the democratic government of India, and India being a signatory to the Ch Charter of Human Rights, cannot overrule the human rights clauses and deal with the Maoists and Naxalites by using brute force, though the brute force has been used. The question is, when the Maoists say that this power is to be seized through armed intervention, what is a demo democratic government going to do? How is it going to respond to it? I have very closely watched this situation in Kashmir, where whenever the militants, the terrorists, attacked the border force, the army, and other paramilitary installations, nobody raised any voice. But whenever the forces retaliated in self-defense, there was a lot of hue and cry. And all the NGOs in Kashmir, outside Kashmir, and even big NGOs like Amnesty International and uh, other NGOs, they raised a hue and cry that the human rights were violated or violated. And the famous axiom we have that it a ter terrorist of one person is the freedom fighter of another person. In the case of Maoists and Naxalites, 
the fundamental issue is that of the government taking natural resources ruthlessly under the pretext of development. The government thinks that no development can, no, no progress can happen unless there's the all round development. And for development, you need land, you need natural resources, you need manpower. So when these, when these elements are taken over by the government and used under the pretext of bringing about development, because without development, these backward classes, the tribal classes, the naturalized, the deprived classes, the poor, poor classes, their lot cannot be changed. So it boils down to be an eco and economic social issue. How best the government can strike a balance like compensation, giving compensation for the lands and the resources that have been used and whether that works or not. For instance, in the case of Kashmir, I remember the natural resources, the said there have been so many verdicts by the courts, even by high courts and administration that the, 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 the sand drawn from the riverbeds, which are dry, should not be vandalized. Despite all these verdicts by the court and actions by the police, the menace of misusing the natural resource of sand has not stopped. Yeah. So, so this is a, this is a question which has to be uh, uh, tackled at various levels. So I think these are some of the observations which I would like to make in the context of what has been said and what might be uh, further elucidated by other speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pandita. Uh, thank you for your intervention and thank you for your uh, very astute observations about the issues. And we will definitely come to some of them in the question and answer session. And as you mentioned, it's a socio-economic issue. And uh, the way in which media has uh, covered this socio-economic issue, uh, we would like to hear first couple of minutes from Praful Ketkarji on this. This is a very good way to have a segue to Praful Ketkarji. So Praful Ketkarji, you are a couple of minutes of intervention, please. Uh, Prafulji, you are on mute. Thank you, Ashokanji. Uh, and uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Bera, for that, uh, you know, covering the entire Maoist movement uh, comprehensively. Uh, I have just three points to make. And in fact, one of them is in the form of more sort of question and I would like to have a clarification from uh, your side. See, for me, uh, Maoist movement was always uh, an urban movement. Uh, urban Naxal is, uh, uh, you know, the term that has used and overused recently. But what has changed from 2004 perhaps is that the frontal organizations are actually created and used as a change strategy because they lost ground in the rural and tribal areas. But the leadership and the ideological mentoring of the entire movement was always urban. In fact, I have traveled in some of the uh, uh, Maoist belts of Maharashtra and Chhattisgarh border, and I didn't find a single uh, 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 person who is a forest dweller and know anything about either Marx or Lenin or Mao. Their issues are totally different. These uh, uh, so-called Maoists are just encashing on their sentiments and misdirecting them uh, towards the state. This is my understanding. 
second issue is more a sort of you know as yashodhan ji has talked about the media thanks to this you know urban character i have a fundamental issue that is ideological as uh, uh, karl popper has talked about the paradox of intolerance this is a paradox of democracy paradox of human rights you want to give all kinds of human rights or constitutional rights to the people who essentially do not believe in human rights and your constitution in fact they want to overthrow this constitution that is the fundamental objective how to deal with this situation you you, you also spoke about and perhaps manoranjan mohanty also you know in my as a political science student i have uh, uh, read him talking about the state failure but sorry the state was not even allowed to enter there all the development activities are actually uh, stopped by the maoist and most importantly i thank that you uh, mention about the decentralization of power and panchayati raj but i know for sure and uh, professor pandita mentioned about uh, professor nalini sundar she is one of the accused in killing of a panchayat leader who is elected sarpanch she is a professor in jnu her husband is a media baron and uh, controlling most of the media narratives for last 20 25 years and he, he was killed for contesting elections standing against the you know uh, maoist directive not to contest the election that was his crime and they are talking about democracy so how to deal with this paradox where state is not allowed to take up the inclusion uh, inclusionary developmental activities hampered by the entire maoist uh, uh, movement the third aspect i think in the present situation is more important and i would like to have your opinion on this is uh, related to china because uh, that is the ideological you know uh, uh, fountain head of maoism and that has seen you know changes over the period of time with unique chinese characteristics you know from uh, uh, mao to deng xiaoping to uh, uh, jiang zemin and now xi jinping uh, from a classical you know uh, unclear maoism to now unclear state uh, uh, controlled capitalism uh, but if i am not wrong uh, sir in 2003 until 2003 4 at least or especially when encomposa took place the south asian alliance was envisaged uh, china had a clear cut role to play as far as uh, arming training and giving ideological inspiration to all these movements and in nepal there was a clear cut intervention and somehow if you see the chinese human rights violations are never discussed or criticized by the so called maoist intellectuals in fact they will whitewash it so this is one important aspect and the second aspect that is emerging that you mentioned about the bangladesh situation the new alliance that is emerging between the maoist and the islamist or islamic fundamentalist uh uh it may be a you know a tactical alliance as mao would have said but uh, i would like to know your uh, you know understanding because that alliance is definitely not working in in the situation of uh, you know uh, zingziang in case of uyghurs uh, so uh, how how are we going to settle with this you know the intolerant violent undemocratic ideological construct uh, which is fundamentally fighting against the democratic framework and we have to fight with them democratically that is i think perhaps the biggest challenge so what are the ways uh, uh, in in the urban areas as well as actual uh, you know on the ground where they are armed i know the situation in bastar where crpf pf camps are proposed and more than 5000 people are camping there because of maoist dictat and uh, the the basic fundamental activities and one of the deadliest you know uh, attack that was taken place on india's 
elected democratic elected leaders of chatisgarh who themselves were tribals and the leader who is camping there they they, they are essentially blocking this you know entire crpf thing to block the developmental activities and also uh, you know so that the the crpf cannot uh, get hold of this person so what is the you know how to dealing this ideological uh, uh, inhuman uh, uh, constructs who do not believe in democratic rights uh, i would like to have your uh, take on this sir thank you thank you thank you praful ji thank you for so wonderfully and succinctly putting up this parad paradox of democracy which we have and thank you for uh, also mentioning some of the international relation related uh, dynamics and uh, international relation re relation related issues here and uh, mention of sharia bolshevism another very important point which you mentioned was about uh, role of crpf and i would like uh, alok bansal ji to make comments about it from internal security perspective and then uh, we have lots and lots of questions from audience uh, i am very sure that they are very uh, our audience are very enthused by your initial remarks by all of you so alok ji uh, your opinion about internal security well